Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. Hi, I'm Alan Stoga, chairman of the Telberg Foundation. One of the ironies of the 21st century is that on the one hand, everyone on the planet seems to have a cell phone and to be actively connected to social media. While on the other hand, many people seem voiceless or at least don't think their voices are heard. The result is a huge chasm between people and their putative leaders almost everywhere. And that breeds corrosive distrust and that distrust destroys democracies. So we convened a conversation to ask what's going on? Who is voiceless and why? Who doesn't know how to listen and why? How can this be fixed? I invite you to listen to the conversation among Baiju Gonkar, a Tibetan activist working at the intersection of technology, art, and social good, Pacho Hildebrand, a Colombian environmentalist working to sustain the Amazon, and Mike Nickenchuk, an applied neuroscientist who works with conflict-affected populations, particularly in the Middle East. Diane Osgood, social impact strategist, moderated the discussion, which was hosted by Vanvaku Revival and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. How do we give voice to the voiceless is the topic we've been tasked to discuss. But we're going to start with a more fundamental question, which is who are the voiceless? And are there structural institutions, uh, barriers that enable some of the voiceless to remain voiceless, or are there some that help elevate them? So we'll start off with you. Hello? Hello. Who are the voiceless? Who are the voiceless? Okay. I think actually, you know, are there people who are voiceless? Don't think so. Uh, Aaron Dutty Royce said that there are only people who are deliberately unheard or silenced, preferably unheard or deliberately silenced. I think, you know, whether if it's like actually having a voice or, you know, through art or protest, um, we can we can say there are the voiceless, but I think it's more who's not listening, who's in a position to listen and do something about it, and who's not listening. And I think by saying that there are the voiceless, we're kind of handing over that responsibility to the people who are actually not having the agency or the power or the access or the privilege to change their situation. We're saying, hey, you don't have a voice, like speak up. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think that's really the right way to see it. Um, so what is a way to see it? Let me tell you another story. Um, so I grew up in Tibet and I remember, I remember I knew what the Dalai Lama looked like, but I couldn't tell anyone I knew what he looked like. People would sometimes just randomly disappear and they'd be like, yeah, you know, he, um, he got taken away and he'll be back, maybe. And I'm like, all right. And it was always never discuss politics or religion in public. Don't ever do it, ever since I was a kid. Didn't know why and I was like, okay. Random inspectors would come into school, ask us first innocuous questions about, you know, do you eat your vegetables? Uh, Do you study? And then it would be, do you go to temple to pray before an exam? Do your parents take you to temple? Didn't really understand what was going on, but I kind of knew. And then I moved to London and someone said, so you want a free Tibet, right? And I said, free Tibet from where? I knew the symptoms of what was happening, but I didn't know the reason. So another element of being voiceless is about knowledge, right? It's it's about the knowledge of the systems that are in place that make you feel powerless, that make you feel voiceless, that render you without agency. And you feel the symptoms of it, but you don't really understand why. And it is in the interest of the people who benefit from these systems for you to not understand. Men and women feel the implications of patriarchy, right? Both genders or all genders, however you want to identify. 
uh, legacies of colonialism, you know, um, we're talking a lot about data and social media. There are interests at play there, but uh, if you don't understand the cause, if you don't understand the structure, it's hard to have a unified voice to know what you want and to know what you want to change even. So there is the power and the knowledge both at play here. We talked a lot about climate yesterday. Does the climate have a voice? It's speaking. Are we listening? Right? It's protesting. Like we can see the, the effects of climate change, but are we listening? So yeah, I think my, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I would say that power and knowledge are the two, like, integral things that are linked with having a voice and not having a voice. And it's not so much who are the voiceless, but who's not listening. Yeah. So if power and knowledge are prerequisite, might be too strong of a word, but conditions which enable a voice to be let out, I won't say heard, but, but voiced, but given space, do we have a, is there a role to be played in giving voice, amplifying voice? And if so, are there, are there conditions attached to that? Well, for me, it's difficult to make a distinction between giving voice and amplifying voice. Um, as you know, we work in the Amazon rainforest with indigenous communities. We saw my father yesterday, our story starts in the 30s with my grandfather and my grandmother who first started working with indigenous communities. So as Alan once said, no, Pacho, you are in, in the long war. It is a long war, no? Three generations at it, a multi-generational commitment for a multi-generational challenge. And the, for us, the concept of accompaniment has been very much at the core of accompanying indigenous communities to navigate these complex realms of interculturality to find a way to be recognized and recognize that other, the Colombian state in this case, in a context where racism and exclusion is part of the norm, in a context where indigenous communities, their authorities, their knowledge is not recognized as a valid knowledge, it's not seen as a, an expression of a culture, but when your authorities are not recognized, your power structures are not recognized, your knowledge systems are not recognized. Um, so there is a deep process of decolonizing, not just the recipient, the state actors, the government, but as well decolonizing communities themselves. They've been battered for hundreds of years, saying your knowledge is worth nothing, your language is worth nothing, your culture is worth nothing. And starting to work with communities, many times the first thing that communities say, well, you're a Western person, the problem is the West, you should know how to solve that, tell us what to do. And, uh, and, uh, and not going in with answers, nor problems, nor solutions, but working on getting back um, a, a sense of dignity and of identity, yes, at the very, very, very core of the process of start building really an, an indigenous agenda, and to arrive to spaces with concrete proposals, not just to claim rights, not just to ask the other person, you're doing this wrong and we have a right, but actually to come with concrete proposals to the table for education, for health, for environmental management. Um, letting go of the wounds of the colonial history. So there is a profound psychological, social and psychological work that is behind. Voices is not just having a participation, a tokenistic participation of indigenous leaders in Congress or in the COP. Who are we listening and what are we talking about? It's not just about having somebody expressing something when their knowledge system is not being considered. It's about building bridges and how to uh, motivate the government at the national and international levels to acknowledge that, as I was saying yesterday, no single culture has the answer to all the challenges. And the way to innovate to face the climatic and social challenges that we have today, we need the best of humanity's intellect. Indigenous peoples have the same IQ, they've been as long, as much as us, 
and they have concrete solutions to bring to the table. The fact that they've been on the margins of technology does not mean less to their solutions. And the, the role of indigenous peoples, not just within their territories, not just within their agenda, but really on opening a conversation between knowledge systems is something that we desperately need at local, national, international levels. So I don't know if I'm addressing the other question, but yeah, of course, there's tons of restraints that are from within communities with the colonial impact and with the tendencies of the Western world regarding indigenous peoples. Too much land for too few, you no, know, all of these preconceptions and, and breaking those boundaries. And I think dignity, recuperating the dignity of a people that have been bashed for so long uh, is the greatest indicator of what a voice could be. I'd love to hear a little bit about timeline. So you said three generations, your family's been involved and dignity. Has dignity, do you have evidence of dignity arising at, at, at this point or is it still further work, longer, gener longer generational approach? I mean, it's an ongoing process, but my grandmother, it was her 100th birthday just a couple of months ago. Fantastic, extraordinary woman. <laughs> Fantastic, extraordinary woman in every sense of the word. I mean, found co-founder of the first department of anthropology in Colombia, pioneer in museology, archaeology in Latin America. For her 80th birthday, she asked as a present to jump on parachute. It was very difficult to get, to get somebody to jump with her, but we did it. But uh, a couple of years we were sitting and she was telling me, Pacho, I can't believe the point to where things are. When I was in the Amazon, in the field, indigenous people would not look at your eyes as a white person. Um, and today you have indigenous leaders, men and women, talking face to face as authority, to authority, to the national government. Um, um, indigenous kids are learning again their language. There is a revival of, of culture and dignity and identity. There's still a long way, but it has advanced. And it has advanced particularly as well because of this amazing ability of indigenous communities of Letting, passing the page of the colonial wound and really engaging into building today, state building today from an intercultural perspective. What can we bring to the table? How can we make this Amazon and this country a better place? And I cannot highlight enough how admirable it is for people who have been through genocide and through all of this to really pass the page and not be claiming, not to be complaining, not to be hiding behind the tragedies of war and sitting at the table and saying, well, we need to live together, just as we were saying before. And we need to build united within diversity. Thank you. Mike, I'd love to hear your views on, um, on listening. So this, <laughs> so this was set up as a conversation about voice. But of course, the other side of that is, are the ears. Who's listening and how? When we talk about listening, we have to think, sure, we can scream that people are racist and horrible, and people suck. We know that. Humans are gross. We're horrible to each other. Why? We can't end the discussion with those accusations and then not ask why, because there has to be another layer of nuance. Otherwise, no one will advance in any discussion. So going back to the cradle of mankind, okay, the last time that the human brain evolved from something other than what we have between our ears now, about 40,000 years, 40,000 years, not quite cradle of mankind, but around that time when Homo sapiens, when we look at the skulls of, of, and evidence from Homo sapiens, about 40,000 years was the last time that the human brain, brain evolved in size and in function. We use it differently. Think how much Athens has changed in 3,000 years, in 3,000 years what it was then, what it is now, what every major human civilization was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, the structure of society, the number of people before agriculture, before cities. When we were hunter-gatherers, we had the same brain. So how we use that brain is different, but the things that dictate to what we listen and why have not fundamentally changed in 40,000 years. And it comes down to two things, either being a values-based decision because you want to listen, or because you're afraid of something. The opposite of fear is not lack of fear, it's love, faith or love. So you either make a choice because of something that you value 
or you're afraid of it. And for a lot of quote unquote voiceless communities, in some cases, in partnering with indigenous communities, sometimes it's the government's making a values based decision because there's a desire to preserve, to honor, to repair genocide, to repair damage that was done, or it's because we're afraid of it. And that doesn't mean we listen to advance its interests, it means that we listen to know how to beat it. All right? And so, I study the human brain, and I largely study threat. I study the stress response in humans, and stress and trauma, and migrants, mainly. But it also applies to governments, and to folks that have ears to listen to a large extent. And there's three primary factors that we've noticed that dictate how and why people listen. And it all comes down to something that makes you feel threat. A threat to status, whether that be economic or political. A threat to identity or an existential threat. If those three things aren't at play, you will likely not give a shit about the person that's talking to you. And that's the reality. That's why we see the, the, the dynamics of different refugee crises playing out differently. If we look at how the United States has responded to Ukraine, Nancy Pelosi being, you know, being so involved in this, it's not because anyone gives a shit about the average Ukrainian. It's because midterm ele elections are coming up. And there is fear, there's a status threat. And it's dark, but it's deeply evolutionary. So I think if we're gonna play the game of getting people to listen, we have to understand what threatens them, or to work towards building a more values-based system that has to be deliberate, and that has to acknowledge the potentiality of a willing reduction of my own power in order to listen to someone else. And that's the game that we have to play, either values, or tapping into fear. And how much of that is about wanting to hear only what supports my values? And how does that play out? So if I only want to hear if, if what you're saying, it's if, I, if I don't have direct economic interest, but I identify with one political perspective or um, yeah, one political perspective, then I don't want to hear another perspective because it challenges my identity. We're literally built that way. We're, we're, we're actually built in our biology for confirmation bias because it helps keep us safe. And it's, it requires actually, what's interesting is, and I think that especially political elites and decision makers, the reason why elite, and elite political rhetoric matters is because they're some of the people who have the greatest influence over the emotional response of the population, turning up or turning down that dial, but it's also hard for folks to do that because they have the most to lose. For a leader to advance a values-based decision for, or to, to take a stand on behalf of listening to, for example, refugees and the political needs, it's a massive threat to their own status. So it's going to have to be driven, driven by something else and create a sense of safety in the population that they're governing in order for there to be any uptake and not simply lose their political seat. And just to add to that, I think... You know, we talk about communication all the time and rationality, but actually, you know, if you go to an advertising agency, it's not about the copy, it's about the feeling that it inspires. It's the same with politics, right? And this is, I think, you know, I work with artists who are coming from conflict areas and, you know, something that we're trying to do is how do you communicate to a deeper part of the human being through non-linguistic means, right? We see, so we say that the world is fractured, but I think in one way that the world is actually very aligned is through that feeling of frustration, of being, you know, unheard, of having their needs unmet, you know, of having that fear that Mike talked about. And there's a lot of frustration and you see it, you know, through extremism, you see it through inertia, whatever it might be. And I think we need to think more about tapping into the feeling of, you know, being voiceless or being empowered and not focus only on the, the words and the communication channels that we are used to. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate.
So what's the link between the feelings and that morality <coughs> and that fear that you, you were just talking about, Mike? Do you see the, can you make a bridge between what she was saying about tapping into the feeling to enable better hearing? For the past 10 years, I've, I've spent most, the majority of my time in various refugee camps around the Middle East. And there's a different landscape of feelings beyond the ones that Beichu was mentioning. There's a feeling of resignation, right? A massive feeling of resignation among the global poor, among refugees and migrants, who know full well. I mean, the, the, just about a few months ago, and let's, let's keep being inflammatory about Poland, because here we are now. Um, you know, and it's, it's incredibly nuanced, but I, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a young man who's him and his brother went from Jordan, and Jordan is a country that has hosted throughout its history refugees, but at the same time is a very poor country that has been dealt with a heavy economic blow from COVID, so can't keep sustaining this open arms response and international support. Look, who's, who's the white refugee du, refugee du jour? It was Ukraine. So a ton of that aid money was thrown there. And before that, it was for Myanmar. And before, no, we can't sustain interest in a crisis or in someone's disenfranchisement for that long because it gets boring. We get bored of the suffering, right? We get bored of the... Is it that we get bored or that we are numbed to the pain and our fear? No, I just don't think people care that much. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah. It, it's, it's bored. Yeah. It's bored. It, it, because prim- the, the dead island Kurdi on the beach in Turkey, it's guilt. It's uh, tapped into guilt, nothing else. And how do, how do privileged people assuage guilt? Throwing money at it. Because there's really nothing else you can do. In the Trump administration, the refugee cap was decimated. Then it was raised, but the institutions aren't there. So we're taking 120,000 refugees to the United States this year. 6,170 have arrived in the first two quarters of 120,000. So I think setting the landscape for that, for that listening requires also recognizing that there's a tremendous sense of resignation and people don't care that they're not being listened to because they're going to keep moving and searching for a better life for their families and for their children. No one expects to be listened to anymore. The idea of, of power paying attention to me, it's, it's now about being sub- surviving by being subversive in a way that can still get you a better life because there is no expectation that I will be listened to. Is that the case for you? Well, no, but I completely agree. I mean, it's a tough one, you know? I mean, um, um, I'm still optimistic, despite uh, seeing the whole context being a very difficult one and a very painful one. Part of our work and my work is dealing with corrupt politicians and people who just really don't give a damn of what's going on. And um, it's a long war, it's a long path. And I think that the in, internal conversation within communities is, is the most important uh, component. And from there, one has to see what it takes you as well in conversations with the other, with other political or interest groups. But that internal communication of finding a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, that uh, internal conversation on defining your own agenda, just as, you know, if you're always moving on the agendas of others, you're always playing on the football, or a game that you don't know all the rules and you're not good at. So the internal conversations in communities on, on repositioning again their cultural values and principles, repositioning again their, their knowledge systems and their ancestral solutions. A lot of the work that we do in the Amazon is to accompany communities, younger generations that work with elders, men and women, um, to research ancestral solutions for critical problems on environmental management or education, decoding traditional knowledge to recode it to address 21st century issues. And uh, that empowerment at the local level and that reconstruction of social and cultural cohesion is the first and major and biggest step on improving a quality of life independently of the economic situation, no? So I agree with what you're saying, you know, getting the attention of that, those external factors or elements is super tricky and you have to play a lot with behavior change and funding transactional motivations, emotional motivations, you no know, pragmatic motivation. That's part of the political negotiation process. But as long as you have a solid base and you have an internal communication, and I don't know how it works with refugees, but I imagine it's the same. You know, uh, in refugee camps, I have a very good friend that uh, has set up um, an amazing program uh, in, in different parts of the world 
doing, it's called, it's called the Great Oven. And he set up, set up great ovens, big ovens to feed people in refugee camps. And then he realized that in the, around the oven was the former jihadist and the, and the LGTB leader sitting down. Both have suffered all the consequences of war. They were both at the end of the, of the road. And they were sitting down one in front of the other and actually realizing how you know, they'd been used you know, in, a, in a certain way by different powers. So, Rebuilding again a sense of, of, of understanding amongst us. Um, it starts at the local level, and I think that's where the great power is. And then the path is long and the war is long. I don't think that there, there's no shortcuts, but uh, having solid foundations there, I think, is the, is the biggest impact. Yeah. Did you hear something? No. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Pacho in that way. I think trust is another element, right? It's like, having trust that someone's got your back. And I agree with Mike. I think, you know, most people have given up on getting the powers that be or the people who have leverage to listen. But the way that we did the exercise about what you want for lunch, I think you heard the people sitting next to you, right? You can hear each other. You can form coalitions, support community. Um, and perhaps I think that is the way forward. I would like the advice of all three or four of you on how we best communicate about the challenges that, that the world is facing in order to um, empower local communities to push and support their leaders to, to act in a global common interest. Um, because that Westphalian state system that, that we're talking about and that we all live within, um, the, the reward system for leadership here does not, in a way, reward action on global crises. But at the same time, we're facing uh, a host of them. Uh, just COVID, uh, the, the war we're talking about, and climate, uh, and, and biodiversity, and, and, and so on and so forth, at the same time. And we seem to not be able to act in a common global interest, partly also because the reward system is, is based on the nation or local uh, connectivity and, and, and somehow there's not an alignment of um, incentives. I'll, I'll speak. So uh, I participate. I, I consider myself a member of multiple communities. One is suburban Republican Illinois, which if you know me at all, it's, it's an interesting mix. And the other is I'm a very proud enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation. Don't look like it. Cherokee. I, I, I pass completely as non-native, and I've never suffered a bias because of that. I'm very aware of that. When I look at the community of Illinois, the, my experience, which is also now supported by research I've been reading on the mindset, the brain, the communication pattern, is that, an, a, it, I love the acronym, it's weird, which is Western, educated, independent, rich, and democratic. That brain does not experience empathy beyond its closest kinship. So literally its neighbors. And I experience that to be very true. And the largest challenge that I experience working on global issues in that community. When I think about my other home community, the Cherokee Nation in its dysphoria, it's the resignation which has led to them not listening, the, the giving up of that holy site has a voice. Because if I can't speak and be heard, then that holy mountain's not going to be heard. And I think that's, that's also a deep fatigue, which is um, not, it, it's preventing more creative solutions to come to the fore. So that's my experience of, of listening and what the barriers are from those two communities, which haven't been voiced here. Um, we tend to forget white suburban America, but it's a very big political power. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, on, because that's a tough one, I mean, how to motivate our leaders to act coherently for common interests at the national or international level. Let's put it another way, how can we use those leaders <laughs> to move the agendas that we are moving for a global interest? And uh, that has been, at least in our experience, a lot what we've done. I mean, continuous 
processes, both at the local level, national level, international level, creating enabling conditions, putting those voices and solutions out there, and creating the context so when the window of opportunity is there, then is when, at least in our case in Gaia, we've approached uh, political leaders. And how we've approached them as well has been a lot through behavior change strategies. For example, the former president, we were at a point where we had all the pieces in place to create the legal framework for the full recognition of indigenous local governments. And we came up to him and basically told him the story that he was going to be the most important, the legacy, no? I mean, you're leaving the government being the most important president in the history of the Amazon Basin. Last president in the 80s gave the territories, you're going to give the government. And uh, working a lot on the emotional part, on the status part, on the identity part of politicians. It sounds Machiavellic and it is, no? <laughs> because at the end of the day, is the, the terms that they have and the time that they have, it's, it's, it's who are you working with? No? And where is power at the end? And where are the solutions being built? And what is the job of those high-level politicians at the end of the day when you have long going processes. So um, how to motivate them when you need them. And, uh, and the hard work is on putting solutions out there that can actually make a mark and a dent and be implemented. I don't know. That's my point. Yeah. But did you have a response? or Mike? At least in the behavior change world, there's two competing school, complementary schools of thought on this. One is, is tapping into that cooperative benefit mindset of what is the potential reward for engaging in a behavior that I know will fundamentally benefit the group that I'm serving. I mean, there's the tapping into the reward side, which I think is just a strategy that all of us have used. Uh, so there's the, the gain argument. Another, one of my favorite experiments in social psychology has, has used uh, virtual reality goggles, little the Oculus things. And it was to promote savings, savings behaviors, financial savings, uh, because folks that have lower incomes or money in, money out, so how do you create a culture of savings? And the best way that they found to do it was to actually put people in a VR scenario where they projected, they sent them, a, they visualized a projection of themselves and their children 30 years in the future. And if they were repeated, they repeated this exposure three or four times over the period of a week, savings behaviors improved dramatically. Because when you're under cognitive load, you have a lesser ability to project yourself into the future, so it makes your decisions more proximal of the here and now concerns. And so by shifting the orientation into the future, which has also been tried to mixed effects for climate change behavior, um, for climate policy action, uh, projecting into the future can lead to behavior changes in the now when you orient the brain to a future threat as opposed to an immediate one. And it doesn't work all the time, but it's an interesting strategy to take that has worked in the financial sector at least. Um, I would talk about stripping back complexities. Um, I think this is something that is quite challenging. I mean, you talked about cognitive load and making decisions. I think when things are presented in too, with too much complexity, whilst you're trying to, you know, pay your rent, whilst you're trying to like take care of your kids, I think this is where the choices become difficult. Um, through technology or through the arts or through other methods, if you can try and strip back the complexity of the big issues that we're tackling, I think that could, you know, potentially be a motivating force, right? Um, you know, all the TV shows and movies like Independence Day with the aliens or like The Walking Dead with the zombies, right? If we're all sitting in this room, everyone has their work, their title, their experience, whatever. But if there was a bunch of zombies trying to eat us right now, how do we reorganize ourselves, right? What are the complexities of our own identities that have been stripped away? And, you know, how do we reorganize and unite against this like one particular challenge? Um, so that's something that I would encourage. I'm going to say something slightly controversial, and I don't think empathy has much of a place in policy making. I think I think I think compassion does, but I think that it would be really foolish to have policy decisions be driven by empathy. I, I just don't think it makes any sense because the goals are completely different. The goal of empathy is is to up, uplift, and the goal of policy is to protect. Uh, and I, I think that 
it's really complicated when we allow space, when we explicitly state that empathy should be a cornerstone of policymaking because it is inherently, humans are short-sighted creatures. And empathy is, is in the here and now, and policy is for the future. And I'm not saying that, it, that compassion has no place, but I, I think it's about setting up equitable policies and enforcing their equitable application. So the, it's, it's not that we don't have empathy for refugees. It's actually quite enshrined in international law. There's, of course, question of climate refugees and other things. But when we're talking about people affected by war, there's the 1951 Convention and the 67 Protocol. It is not enforced equally. Turkey, for example, has adopted both the 51 Convention and 67 Protocol. But the way that the protocols are written, it applies to European victims of war. So Turkey actually recognizes the rights of European refugees. It does not apply to Syrians. They're not, uh, except on U.S. census forms, they're not white Europeans. And so it, it's, it's not that these empathy hasn't been built. We, we know how to protect our fellow men, and it's quite enshrined in policies. We just have never bothered to apply it in a way that applies to black, brown, Muslim people the same way it applies to others, or even to the poor the same way we apply it to the rich. I think that compassion needs to play a role in certain policy decisions, but I would not say that empathy should, should drive it. There are certain times when it's needed for advocacy. And I think it's the same with what we were talking about. I mean, t tapping into that sh sense of, of shared experience. Um, you know, in, in, in Poland, yes, absolutely. Neighbors. Neighbors. It, it wasn't a hard sell to take in Ukrainians because there have been neighbor countries for so long. I mean, there's a certain familiarity of this could happen to me. You're right next door. There's a shared legacy. So, I don't know. I, I, I still debate how empathy should play a role in how we make policy decisions. I, I think the question also, I heard another question in there, which is how to have the, the civic support for the policies, right? And is empathy involved in, in garnering the civic support for the policymakers to make those policies? I mean, I started off talking about power and knowledge, and I think that's a part of the civic support, right? To understand the structures of power, to understand the systematic processes that are happening. Yeah, and then to distribute knowledge so that communities can better understand how to act within you know, the, the limitations of their constraints. Yeah, but I think that there, no, I agree with both of you in the sense that empathy is an absolutely necessary capacity skill in order to engage into any conflict resolution or anything, no? But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the driver for policy making, no? And in our experience, again, as I mentioned, indigenous communities marginalized all the, the whole context. I mean, the first step is recognizing the other, even if their recognition is that we're in total disagreement. No, that's the first step. So having that ability of trying to understand where the other one is coming from, that empathy is fundamental in order to pass from the recognition of, of the other to the next step that it is recognizing a common problem or a common objective. And to pass the conversation from this you, me, to turn the heads out towards a common, not a common objective. And those are, those are, 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 are the key, as you very well know, in negotiation skills, no? But I think empathy is, fun, is fundamental. Um, uh, but it's not necessarily the driver. And in the case of the Amazon, the driver for the policies and everything has been identifying common challenges and, and being capable of, of, of creating a context where that common challenge can be solved jointly, which is a very difficult thing to do, no? because generally one person wants to put the answer and the solution. But common challenges, the territories where we work, there are no local governments. I don't know if there's any country in the world where you have a national government, a national government, and no local governments at all. So, I mean, consolidating the structure of the state, territorial um, social cohesion, you know, in a country, war-torn country, having a population that is not a floating population, that is not being you know, recruited by different armed groups. So, in, the, in as much as we identify common objectives with the government, be it the right or be it the left, and that's been quite an interesting thing because there is no, 
uh, at least in the case of where we work in the Amazon rainforest, we've managed to navigate be it with the right government or left government. Uh, you know, it's about on how to identify common problems and recognize each other. So yes, empathy is fundamental. Um. I guess more of a question, like, isn't it also about personalization, you know, like to, to feel like someone is personally important to you, right? Um, you know, in Tibet, we say who's the most powerful person after the king, and it's the king's daughter, right? Um, Putin and Xi Jinping, you know, they have this kind of bromance, not just because of the relationship between China and Russia, but I think they have an understanding of each other as people as well, right? Xi Jinping's the first, um, you know, he's the, he's the first person after Mao to consolidate so much power and he has a very clear vision for what China's legacy should be, what his legacy should be. He believes in the ethics that he, you know, kind of promotes. Like, he, he thinks that this is more than just about politics. And Putin obviously has a similar vision for his own legacy and what Russia should be and restoring the, the greatness of the Russian empire and of the, of, you know, of the Chinese cultural dynasty. So I do think it's also about um, you know, human to human. You're negotiating in a room and you're representing these big ideas, but um, is it also about getting them to like each other and forcing them to build some kind of a relationship that's outside of the complex ideas they're representing or powers that they're representing. Question. Do you want to go? Very, very briefly, it, I 100% I agree, Thomas. And I, I, I also wonder from myself, how much, though, is that ability to practice empathy, whether it's in multilateral negotiations or policy making, is still bounded by identity markers? Because I'm thinking, right, what came as soon as you said that, I said, absolutely. But I thought of the case, again, of Syria. I mean, I'm very biased to the Syria example. When the U invasion of Ukraine started and Putin started bringing in Chechens, he also started bringing in Syrians um, from, re from regime. Uh, Assad at this point is Putin's the puppet master for Assad in Syria. And one thing that the Russians did was that they set up around 45 stations in Syria, in regime-held areas of Syria, and started to recruit men who had previously been trained by the Syrian army to fight in Russia, on behalf of Russia, as mercenaries in Ukraine. Within the first 24 hours, more than 5,000 men signed up. And a large part of the reason was because they offered life insurance. If the person dies in Russia, uh, fighting on, in Ukraine, fighting on behalf of Russia, the family will receive $3,000. Right now, the current government employee salary in Syria is around $15 per month because of the hyperinflation of the Syrian pound. So why is there that level of desperation to go die and get my family $3,000, 5,000 men in 24 hours? A large part of that is because of the Caesar Act that was passed under the Trump administration and putting crippling sanctions on Syria. And so our empathy still, even in the negotiations process, is bounded by this us, these us-them markers, and that's going to be a huge boundary because where do we draw those lines and to what extent do we have to force ourselves outside of the convenient form of empathy to really make some radical policy decisions? Beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you. So what do you think? Is the problem that too many are voiceless or that too many are not listening? Is the solution to speak louder, to scream perhaps, or do we need to think differently about how we engage people in the important conversations that shape their futures? Thanks for joining us. And please subscribe to New Thinking for a New World on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>